I'll never forget when they handed me the keys. Can you all hear me? When they handed me the keys to this white, decrepit Astro van. And they told me I was in charge of getting us from Colorado to northern Arizona. And I thought, I don't think this thing's going to make it out of the parking lot, let alone make it all the way to northern Arizona. And I was looking at the car that the other group was given, which was a brand new rental shiny and I was thinking why did they pick me for the white minivan but in my heart of hearts I knew it was my quest and so we get in the the astro van and we start taking an assessment of what was actually in the car and what was going on and soon discovered that there was no radio and no CD player, and just one tape, and a tape player. And it was Joshua Tree's, uh, uh, it was U2's Joshua Tree album. And so we knew that we were going to be cruising, listening to that tape over and over and over and over and over again. And so as we began our journey and made it to White Mountain, Arizona, where we discovered the Apache Indian tribe that we would spend the summer on, I began to learn that I was going to spend a lot of time in the minivan because I had selected the easiest job, which was to be the speaker for the camp. And I had picked that because the summer before that, I had done the vacation Bible camp, and I knew that was a hard job. And so I wanted the job where I just had to speak for like 15 minutes in front of the youth, and then I could do the whatever I wanted for the rest of the time. I thought, what a great gig that would be. And so I signed myself up to be the speaker. I gave the same talk every, every day, the same talk for the whole summer, over and over and over again. By the middle of the summer, people started coming up to me and saying, hey, like, I kind of understood some of the stuff you were saying, like, good job. And I was like, all right, like, nobody told me to do this. I just kind of picked it. And so here I am now, like, I guess this is working out and it's, it's going really good. And you know why the Apaches picked this Indian reservation, because it was one of the beautiful, most beautiful places I had ever been. And there was a running river r flowing through the middle of it and it was green and there was big sky country out there and long roads and they had a big plot of land and their, their land would stretch out for miles and miles and it was hot but then about midday there would always be this uh, little rainstorm that would come and sort of break the heat and it was like the grace of God came to us and visited us over and over and over again. And so as I was driving one day and I was listening to and the streets have no name, I was turning down a road that literally had no name. And I remember thinking to myself, self, like, this is the most incredible summer of your life. Um, and I felt so deeply connected to something bigger, so alive, in a way that I had never felt alive before. Like somehow I had stumbled into a purpose and a meaning and a good God who cared for me. And I think we all have these kinds of moments, these transcendent moments, this holy hum that resonates in us, that speaks to us about how there's something bigger going on in life. Like there must be something more to what's going on. And we go to a concert, we go to the beach, or we go somewhere, and we connect to this holy hum. It just doesn't happen in our peak moments, but also in our valley moments. And I've also been able to experience this over the last few months, because we have a close friend and neighbor, actually really a co-worker of Katie's that moved into our neighborhood, and she's been a really good friend to this couple who 
had this terrible news come to them that the baby growing inside the mother at three months got a diagnosis of a strange heart defect, a rare heart defect, that would give that baby's chances of making it through life almost impossible. 99.9% not going to happen. And so they were faced with a difficult decision. Do we take this baby into the world or do we just give up? And so they made the courageous choice to continue and to have this baby and to carry old Jaylee into the first four months of her life until she passed away. And they relied on the God of the universe the whole time. And in fact, the courage that they have is made manifest and the fact that whenever we have problems, they're the first ones to ask. They're the first ones to care and to love us. And so we see not only in the valley, I mean, not only in the peaks, but also in the valley, not just with the concert and the ocean and the astro van, but also in our deepest, darkest moments, we begin to ask the question, there is something bigger than this, something more than this. Is the holy hum present in both places? Is the divine nature of God a part of what's going on in the everyday, ordinary circumstances of our life? And so why do I bring that up in a conversation about good news evangelism for Redondo Beach? Because I think it's so easy for us to think if we've been around church for a while, that every last person on earth is not in a desperate search to find God. That it can be kind of like we here are on that quest, but the people out there are off doing their own dark thing. But if we identify these types of moments that all humans experience the way that the Hebrew prophets would describe them. We would describe them as holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty and the whole earth is full of his glory. And so if we have a heart beating in our chest and a sun rising this morning, then we have a God who woos us. And he's saying, look at the good news of your existence out here. Look at how incredible life is. We can't conjure up good news. The good news is already there. Christ's death and resurrection, Christ's light out of darkness, and all our job is to do is to draw that light out of every person. To guide people and to say, can you see and hear that this is good news? Let me show you where it comes from. Let me point you to the great source of the source of the source of it all. That is what the good news is. And so don't take my word for it. There's much better evangelist than me that we're going to read today. And his name is Paul. And so will you turn with me? And we're going to go to Acts today, chapter 17. Or you can just listen in. And we're going to begin at verse 16. And we're going to kind of stick at this first verse for a second. It says, in Athens is the title of my Bible. When Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. And we need to ask some questions about the background as we jump into the text. And the first one here is we get some insight into what motivated Paul. We don't always get that. Sometimes we just get to see what they did. But today we get to see that Paul's motivation was he walked into a foreign place that was so different than his culture and upbringing. And when he got there, he saw 
the multiplicity of thousands of idols, idols named for every last seeming thing on earth that is attributed to some god, and th there he was disheartened, and I think his, he was disheartened not because he judged that community, but because he wanted them to know the source, the true source of those things that they liked and enjoyed. And he wanted to point them to the light. He wanted to give them the fullness of the picture of the view of God and his unfolding. And so he was disheartened by the fact that they did not yet know. And so they were cheering and, you know, praising idols. This context is so different than what we see in one of the most exciting parts of the Bible, which is the day of Pentecost. And what Peter got to do as an evangelist, right? Because Peter gets up there, and he speaks to a Jewish audience, and he reads from the Jewish scripture. You ever wonder about that? He just reads from Joel, and after he reads from Joel, then 3,000 people repent, and they get baptized, and they start the Jesus movement, and Peter gets to stand there in all victory and say, look at this great harvest that I get to reap, right? What a fantastic climactic moment. And we, as pastors, always want it to be Pentecost. We always want that big moment where everybody wants to come to Jesus and repent and be baptized. But here's Paul, and he's in Athens, and we're going to discover that even some scholars say that this was a failure journey of evangelism. I don't think they're right about that, but the picture here is so different. And the reason for that is the context, because the context for Peter was generations and generations of Hebrews that were looking for a Messiah. They wanted to know that there was a Savior coming. And so when the Spirit of the Lord descended and it was revealed to them who the Messiah was, then it was a, a, a repentance that happened quickly and many people came to the Lord because they had been using the same scripture up until that point. So the framework was laid. Well, when Paul walks into Athens, he doesn't have any of that. Okay? He is walking into a place named after the foreign goddess of sex, and he is disheartened by the idols that are there. And he is in a totally different new culture to him in Athens. And he's discovering all kinds of idols. And he must have felt like, whoa, where am I and how did I end up here? And so his distress leads him to do some interesting things. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace. So he went into the temple, and then he went out into the streets. And he talked to anybody who was there. And a group of Epicureans and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him, so he got into debates. Some of them asked, what is, the ba what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching, and here it is, the good news about Jesus and his resurrection. And then they took him and brought him to a meeting of Agropolis, where they said to him, May we know that this new teaching that you are presenting and you are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. And all the Athenians and foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and li listening to new ideas. I find this fascinating that this little par parenthetical note is there about the spirituality of this culture that somehow they were open to different points of view. And I think this is connected deeply to our culture. They had never heard about Jesus, which is very different than our culture. But they had a spirituality. They had an openness. They, they had these experiences that led them to want to know, what is that something bigger? And they had an offering of a multiplicity of ideas that they provided in the public space, and they were on some seeking quest to find the truth. And so they were at least willing to hear Paul out on his proclamation. 
And so I want to just talk a little bit, to bring this into our concrete world, a few of our contextual issues that come into Redondo Beach and the good news to bring to Redondo Beach. I think I have a bad graphic that I made um, if you want to see this. Okay, so um, four things that I think are four currents of our cultural moment when we think about church, when we think about evangelism, we think about the people in these doors and outside of these doors, how do we bring a good news message to them? One of them is an obvious one that we are in a modern society, right? Nobody rode in on a horse today, but maybe some of us wanted to, but we have a totally different culture, and we have a telephone that is no longer one of those big things, you know, that you got to hunk around that my dad used to have because uh, he was a cool lawyer, but uh, we have a, a little computer in our pocket that can give us all the information possible. We live in an information age, and that affects the way we communicate and talk to each other and share ideas and how much access to ideas that we have in the public square and the internet is in a way the agropolis of today right it's the place where all of these ideas are shared endlessly over and over and over and over again okay and we also live in a post-christian culture meaning that a lot of people know jesus his name they've heard some version of that story but as i've said before he often needs new PR. He needs new public relations. People who can represent the real way of Jesus, the real truth of Jesus, to combat some of the ways that this message has been manipulated. Okay, so that matters when you go out and you begin to try and have a conversation about somebody about Jesus. Because if you begin in a way like I experience as I drive down the uh, Hawthorne and PCH regularly as I come to work of somebody standing on the corner saying how terrible I am and how God judges me and does not like me. I don't want to say, but I'm driving to work to my job. As, at, I'm a pastor at a church. Does God really hate me? Like, I don't think. I, you don't know me. Okay? And so because you don't know me, you're making a message out there that is probably not going to connect. It's not drawing any light. It's not good news. That's not to say we don't talk about sin, but the way that we do evangelism is to say we act like Jesus, who had a method of saying, come follow me. Come and see. Come and find the light. I want to know you, and I want to speak deeply into you as an individual. I want to disciple you on the long road of discipleship in order to do effective evangelism. This isn't a one-time flash-in-the-pan moment. This is a lifelong journey in the way of Jesus, who is so good and so loving and so caring and so patient and so forgiving that you need to know him. Okay, and we have all of these things in our culture. Isn't it funny that if a couple who maybe doesn't attend church or really think that much about the Bible, but if they want to get married, who do they come? They still find the pastor or the religious figure. Or if there's a funeral, that those rituals around a funeral often come from a, a deep place of spirituality. Because we have to frame our lives, our, our calendar of just how we live our lives and seasons and how they flow is all based off of these ideas. And so the, the hum of our world is framed by these deep, meaningful religious activities. And yet, sometimes they're so rejected because they're so misrepresented. Okay? And we're also the, this generation upcoming, millennial generation, is a byproduct of divorce. And what that teaches us about our culture is that when hard things happen, this isn't to pick on anybody, and of course, this is something our culture is experiencing, but it happens to teach people that when divorce happens, when conflict happens, that the thing to do is to walk away. And we can, as millennials, double down on that. We walk away from community so fast. Anytime there's something hard, we go find somewhere else to do community. And so church is not okay and accepted just on its own. 
community is a difficult place. Church is a difficult place. So to help people, we have to build trust with them and care for them, okay? And then the last one is byproduct of the megachurches. This is to pick on megachurches. This is to say that a church trend that has uh, happened in the last 20 years has been to a trend of allowing for, getting a lot of people in a room on Sunday. This is no particular church, but that the entertainment culture is such a large part of how we do church that it becomes a pick and choose, I like or I don't like, and if I don't, if I'm not entertained, if I'm not enthused by what's going on, or the people that are there, I'm going to go find the next church down the block. That's radically different than 50 years ago when people just went to their local church. So these influences are all impacting how we do evangelism in our culture. I tell that to you because these are ways to be thoughtful about how do we approach somebody with the good news of Jesus Christ. Okay? And then join with me again, Paul, in in verse 22. Paul then stood up in the meeting of Agropolis, me standing on a place that you may have heard of. It's called Mars Hill. Okay? Mars Hill. Mars is the god of war in this culture. Mars Hill. And said, people of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. I love that. He doesn't say you're very evil. He says you're very religious. Interesting. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing that you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, and the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples built by human hands, And he is not served by human hands, as if he needed something. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. For one man he made all nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. God is not far away. He is here. And you feel him because you have an altar to an unknown God. And that thing that you made, let me tell you about that thing that you made. This is where it really comes from. This is a real source of all that seeking and longing that you have in your hearts. For in him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. So the ones you already believe in, that truth that you already found somewhere else, the Reformed tradition calls this common grace, that God's truth is for all people in all places. And Abraham Kuyper, the Dutch theologian, says there's no single square piece of the earth that does not claim mine. And so they found a little bit of truth, and Paul doubles down and highlights this truth. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. Nobody, I'm sure, in our culture struggles to think that God is silver or gold. What an what a ancient, just arcane belief. That's a joke. Okay. In the past, <laughs> overlooked such ignorance, but how he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. And then I want to see that what an incredible thing to say. I mean, I wish I could come up with this type of speech to give, right? And to really be such an effective uh, person who can see the culture, to identify the places in culture that would resonate with people, and then to move them towards God and how the God is the source of them. 
But see how Paul was received on this day. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, and others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council, and some people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them were Dionysus, a member of, Agro- a member of the Agropolis, also a woman named Demarius, and a number of others. Now, there are lots of Christian names in this church. Uh, you know, there's Peter's, Paul's, there's Mary, okay? But nobody is named Dionysus, okay? How come? That's a biblical name too, right? Dionysus. But that is the name of the pagan god of partying and drinking. Okay, so I don't think anybody thought, well, I should name my child Dionysus, you know? That would be a very interesting identity for that child. But can we see here Paul, what Paul did? He went into a place named after the foreign goddess of sex, and he stood on a hill named after the foreign god, or the pagan god of war. And he converted a person, a listener, that day who was named after the pagan god of drinking and partying. What an incredible work that Paul did on that day to go all the way out where the streets have no name that he could recognize and to bring in, to start to bring in this Gentile group and to convert them and to teach them about Jesus and to point them to the source of all that lives and moves and has their being. Okay, so one uh, more thing as we close here, the practical way that this lands and landed for me uh, this past Thursday, we have some pictures, I think, if we could see. Okay, so here is a picture of items that you all donated to a a guy named Daryl, and Daryl has, uh, was homeless for about seven years, living out on the street, and this past Thursday, we did a house blessing for Daryl, and so I'm going to tell you a little bit about his story. Uh, These are the items that we gave him. He was given an empty apartment, and so our church came alongside, and we provided all of the furnishings for Daryl. And his story is, there's a lady named Miriam who comes to the 830 service here, and she began a ministry called Hot Dog and a Prayer, and she would go outside Harbor General, and she would meet with different homeless folks, and she would, over time, get to know them really well, and she would pray for them, care for them, check in on them, and during this time, this thing happened in our city, where the city is wanting to alleviate homelessness, and what they've figured out is that it costs more money to keep somebody on the streets with all the medical bills and all the jail bills and all the, all the other stuff that the cost of somebody living on the streets incurs, and they've figured out that it's cheaper to give them an apartment, a place to live, okay? And so all of a sudden, coming to our church even, is uh, a group called Harbor Interfaith that started coming to local churches, moved away from that, and is now starting to come back to the local church because Norma, for the last 25 years, has been loving and caring for the homeless of this city in a way no other church in this community is. And she gives them a hot meal twice a week with her team. And so we have all these relationships with these homeless folks, okay? And Miriam has figured out the next step, which is how to take somebody who's been living on the street from being homeless into this apartment. And the way that she's done that is Rhonda, Daryl's uh, uh, girlfriend, one day, after being cared for for many years by Miriam, was walking out the street. She stumbled into the street drunk, and she got into a car accident, and she got hit, okay? And she ended up in the hospital, and when she was in the hospital, that was her rock bottom, and she decided she wanted to change her life, and she went through this whole program, and through this whole program, at the end of that program, they gave her one of these houses, 
and Miriam walked her through all of that, and she blessed her and gave her a house blessing, okay? And Daryl saw Rhonda do all of this, and he decided he wanted to get sober too. And so he went to a year-long program and then came out of that program, was provided this house, and I got to show up with bikes, and I got to show up with a blender and all of this stuff, and I got to take all of your glory in that moment. And we walked in, and Miriam was doing what she does so well, which is loving and caring for this couple. And let me just tell you, I do not need therapy. All I need is to walk into a house of somebody who did not have a home and had their life transformed, and to see them when I walk in with a couple of bikes and a blender raise their hands to God and praise God and thank him that some random stranger just walked into their house with just a couple furnishings to furnish their apartment. And then to sit with Miriam and to listen to Miriam. She kept asking me, she's like, Pastor, do you have a word to say to them? And I'm like, oh, I didn't plan anything. So I gave, I, I tried my best. And then she came in and she said her story she said, the reason why I started this ministry is because I suffered a couple personal losses. I lost my mom and I lost my sister in a short time period. And out of that, she said, I felt orphaned. I felt alone. But then I remembered that God is my father. And so I am never alone. And so he spoke to this couple, and she spoke to this couple in this room. She said, out of that suffering, I was inspired to tell every person that God is your father and that you are not orphaned, you are not alone. That God cares for you and he loves you. That is good news. That is the whole good news. Because I had a meeting, I've been trying to do this myself, and let me tell you, it's standing in line getting IDs and social security cards, and it is sitting with this, these couples as they look for long lost relatives and praying for them, and ups and downs and battles, and I just got to come right at the end, right at the best part, right? But Miriam walked them all the way through every checklist possible she could think of. And she continues to disciple this couple. That is evangelism. That is an evangelism that's available to all of us. And we don't need to look further than the person in our community that just needs the light to be identified within them one at a time. One Dionysus at a time. Clear to them. Do you see this? Do you feel this hum? Let me tell you the God who created it. Will you pray with me? Lord, we thank you, God, that you are the author of good news. You are the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, Lord. We know that we fall short. We do not represent you perfectly, God, and yet you use us. And yet you you give us your good news to proclaim, to set the captives free. Lord, give us a heart. Expand our heart for the community outside of these doors. Help us to love in a way that you would love. Help us to speak truth in the way that you would speak truth. Help us to confront sin in the way that you would confront sin. Help us to give grace the way that you would give grace. Help us to give forgiveness the way that you would give forgiveness, God. And we will come to know in all, your, in all your fullness, Lord, the glory that you've laid out for us. God, we thank you that one day all of this work shall be done. But until then, Lord, give us this courage and the wisdom to know how to join with you in this great work you're doing. In your name we pray. Amen.